Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, we are in our final program of the day, and I am going to be stepping aside and bringing up Joe Porter, uh, who will be moderating this talk. So I am going to. Joe? Hello, world. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Attendees with us. Yes, Hello, and we are growing. So as you and as Joe, as you announce each panelist, uh, I'll bring them in. Fantastic. It's great to see some familiar faces in the audience already. We've got a treat in store for you this evening at this late hour on the East Coast. Um, for those of us on the East Coast, um, this is like story time for adults. So thank you for making it this far. and. We're about to whisk you away um, around the world, quite literally, on a magic remote webinar carpet ride um, to check in with alumni who are doing absolutely amazing things. Um, so I'm going to bias just a minute here uh, to allow everyone's connections to stabilize and to get you all comfortable. Um, so uh, you've entered without audio or video. If you're in the audience, you do not need to fix your hair or be mindful of any background noises. Um, you can save your questions for the chat, which is on the right-hand side of the screen. Feel free to say hi. Feel free to type in where you're coming from, if you're coming from the East Coast or the West Coast or from somewhere else in the world, as many of our panelists are. Um, go ahead and try that out. It's the chat on the right-hand side. <laughs> and... Um, Throughout the presentation tonight, you'll have the chance to use that chat box. Um, feel free to carry on conversations with each other. Um, we welcome you to ask questions, offer reactions, send love to our amazing presenters around the globe um, who've greeted you at some very strange hours, um, or carry on conversations amongst yourself. Um, we'll probably, for the first, most of the first hour, um, be taking control ourselves, but we're going to save at least the full half hour at the end if you can stay with us that long. Um, for audience questions. Um, and while I'm pretty good at this from teaching online for years, I'm not great. So I won't see all of your comments. The easiest way to make sure that I get your question, if you really want it to be asked, is to use the at symbol, which is to the right of public, looks like an at, um, and you can at me. And that way I can filter out um, through all of that and try to uh, identify any questions. So feel free to ask them at any point. I'll keep them in a little piggy bank until the end. Um, and we'll start to work through those a little later into the presentation. So at this point, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the BAC. Um, thank you for joining us this evening or morning or afternoon, as you see from some of our panelists. Um, in fact, it is quite late on the East Coast, um, but Jesse is joining us from Rwanda, where it is 5 a.m. So stifle your yawns, East Coasters. She has you beat, as far as I'm concerned, for odd hours. Uh, Phil is joining us from Beijing, where it's late morning. Andres is joining us from Ecuador, where it's a slightly kinder 10 p.m., I believe, right? All right. Um, some of you may know that uh, this is the end of a day-long event um, that we're bookending here. Um, but this whole event is a bit of a pivot. We recently held, our, or we would have held our spring gala here in Boston, where a small handful or a pretty large handful of our network um, may have had the chance to participate and support the BAC in its mission to provide design um, education emerging from practice and accessible to diverse communities. Um, but I think what we've ended up is uh, something even better. Um, now we have a panel of BAC alumni assembled from all over the world, uh, not only as panelists, but joining us in the audience um, to talk about global design practice. So in my opinion, um, a pretty awesome trade-off. <laughs> so our topic is not only timely, um, but it's personal. Um, it's personal for every single one of us, however located. It's um, one of the things that's perhaps most striking about this pandemic is the way that it's highlighted just how connected we all are, however distanced. Um, we're all affected, not only by the pandemic, but by the chain reaction, the ripples, the domino effect that it has set out into the world. We're all learning how to navigate a new set of circumstances and contexts, and we're being asked to proceed um, uh, amidst these changed, uh, changed contexts. So what usual effect is some brief introductions for me, 
a series of short presentations from our panelists where they'll each share their own experiences with practice during this pandemic around the globe. Um, and again, during the presentations, feel free to use the chat um, and we'll rejoin at the end for a plenty of audience questions. So um, a bit about me, why am I here? I, <laughs> I came to architecture and the BAC actually from an undergraduate in international studies, uh, development and environmental design. I spent a good deal of my education abroad in places like China, Denmark, Greece, hey Phil, China. Um, and uh, it was in Thailand though, where I was studying um, a pipeline project. And it, I was no noting how minority groups were affected um, by this policy decision um, in Myanmar, formerly Burma, and something clicked. You know, ideas are one thing, but they actually play out in space. Um, it's where they actually hit someone's village that they start to make real tangible impact. And I knew I wanted to, do, to be right there. I wanted to be where ideas became real um, and where I had a shot at maybe affecting change somehow. Um, and the people in our panel are doing precisely this. So I spent years working in engineering. I gravitated towards architecture. I did not have a portfolio. And as a second career as an adult, um, coming to the BAC was really uh, the way to go. Um, I couldn't imagine a full-time academic career without a full-time job. Um, my life could not be on hold for that long. So the BAC was the perfect answer. Now I'm an associate here at Boston at Ingenuity. I practice healthcare design. I'm managing a series of really exciting projects for Boston Children's Hospital, um, spanning from neurodevelopmental centers to uh, research labs. I teach architectural history um, at night, and we're always interested in making sure students not only understand their contexts, but have the imagination to help foster new ones. So anyway, I come to this with the excitement of someone who loves to see where the rubber meets the road. Um, that opportunity is, is our opportunity in design, and we all have the, uh, the ability to inflect reality um, in the best way possible. So for me, this is truly adult story time at 11 p.m. I'm so excited to hear from you all. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce you to our first panelist who is actually joining us um, via YouTube, <laughs> very recently recorded. Rwandan internet does not love this platform. Um, so in the interest of not having you mired with connection issues, we're going to show her a 10 minute introduction presentation um, by, via YouTube. Hi, my name's Jessie. Jess Hi, my oh. name's Jessie we'll Flynn. Go. I'll introduce her afterwards. No, I won't. All right. So uh, Jesse Flynn is a partner at the Disruptive Factory with 20 years of experience in landscape architecture, agriculture and forestry, international community development work and business development and entrepreneurship. She brings a holistic design thinking approach to work on nature and people based solutions. She's a designer, an ecologist, a brewer and a systems thinker. She's a landscape architect focused on uh, one design health. She uh, developed the concept design and curriculum framework for the Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture, an agricultural campus based on the concept of One Health with Mass Design Group. She's worked on site planning and landscape design for Mass's University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, New Redemption Hospital Caldwell, Liberia, Butaro Oncology Support Center in Rwanda. I will destroy this. Nyarugenje District Hospital in Rwanda, Equal Justice Initiatives Memorial for Peace and Justice in the US and the Ellen DeGeneres campus of the Dian Fossey Guerrilla Fund in Rwanda. She has a BA in journalism and environmental studies, graduated with, um, from the Master of Landscape Architecture program at the BAC, served in the Peace Corps in Panama um, as the Conservation Program Officer for Earthwatch Institute and as an urban forester for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. She's gotten around. Um, she's also Massachusetts certified arborist and horticulturalist, and she's overseeing the startup of Quiza Craft Brewery, a female-led business in Kigali, Rwanda. Take it away, YouTube and Jesse. I'm speaking to you from Rwanda. I'm speaking to you from Rwanda. I'm going to talk to you tonight about Rwanda's response to COVID, how that ties to One Health, how that ties to One Health, and how One Health ties to design. Um, so I'm Jesse. I got a Master's of Landscape Architecture in 2015 from the BAC, and I'm currently a partner at the Disruptive Factory. I consult at One Health by Design, and I'm the managing director of Koiza Craft Brewery. Um, I live in Rwanda, middle of the African continent, small landlocked country about the size of Massachusetts. I'm um, in the context here that most people know Rwanda by as guerrillas, the genocide of, against the Tutsi in 1994. Um, but Rwanda really is a very fast growing country with a lot of things happening, um, which also means that there are situations 
in infrastructure that are caused that that have exacerbated potential COVID um, problems, such as um, you have different land use patterns, people with lots of space and luxury and and people that are in informal settlements with many people sharing very tight quarters. Um, and on the right is an aerial shot of a typical part of Kigali where you see different land use patterns and de densities side by side. And things like the need for water um, is an infrastructure and design issue that causes situations where people are exposed to pandemics by sheer need for, for daily water. Um, Rwanda does have experience with Ebola um, and so therefore is was well prepared to, to cope with COVID. So the borders are very effectively manned and they have contact tracing for anybody that they find is infected. Um, everywhere we go, there were, you know, physical design responses, essentially, that there's hand washing at all entry and exit points, people wear masks by requirement, um, trucks that come in and out of the country, which are the only vectors at this point, there's no community transmission in the country. Um, it's all by transport, so there's methods put in place for that. Socially and economically, there's also pressures. Um, on the left are people that were found violating, um, you know, they weren't wearing masks, they were out, you know, on non-urgent needs, and they're brought and educated in public as a kind of public shaming, um, you know, response to, to put pressure on people. Um, and on the right is that the economy turned into a delivery economy so that people decentralized and didn't come to central shopping places um, to reduce disease vectors. And as a response, Rwanda has one of the lowest rates of COVID in the world. Um, we have you know, mid 400 um, cases. The two deaths that we've had to date um, were people that got sick outside of the country and then came home once they were critical. Um, and COVID is a One Health issue. Um, it's One Health is that human ecological and animal health are inextricably intertwined. And 75% of the diseases that you and I get um, originate in livestock or wildlife, such as COVID, Ebola, HIV, AIDS, Zika. Um, and these originate usually in land use pattern issues such as deforestation and other land use changes, intensified agriculture, wildlife trade, climate change, um, microbial and, uh, resistance, and our ability to move these things um, very fast around the face of the earth via airplane. Um, in Rwanda, um, what this kind of means for thinking about design is we have one of the highest population densities on the continent with about a thousand people per square kilometer um, or square mile and about 500 people per square kilometer. And the population is doubling. Um, we had 12.6 million people last year, 25 million expected by 2050. Um, and the impact on land use is extraordinary. On You can see the dark green forests, light green grasslands and, and white farmland here and then it reverses to primarily farmland. There's not more land. They're not making land anymore. So that means that when there's no more land, but there is population growth, the pressure is on the land to produce more. Um, in Rwanda, 80% of people rely on agriculture as their livelihood, yet already 21% of people are food insecure. And so as the population doubles, that insecurity will only increase. And this ties to public health, the land use patterns. Um, this is malaria um, earlier in the century and malaria increase um, that mirrors the, the land use patterns and population growth. And so again, land use um, is tied to public health. And so as I said, they're, you know, they're not making land. So how do we make sure that we intensify and diversify each square meter so we can feed the growing population? At the same time, how do we plan to, to put ecological diversity into this system so that we're not setting ourselves up for worse pandemics because of ecological degradation? Um, and the, again, the concept of one health, that human ecological and animal health are inextricably intertwined can bring, be brought into design. And this all goes to support the sustainable development goals also. Um, you know, a strong economy that is supported by a healthy and equitable society um, needs to be supported by a healthy biosphere. We need to eat, we need water, so we need to take care of our natural resources. 
And how do we do that? Um, on the left is a typical land use pattern here where there's a lot of exotic species for lumber and firewood, um, monoculture of crops, concrete infrastructure, buildings that are um, you know, made um, of, of imported materials have high energy use. And on the right is moving towards a One Health design, an integrated system where we think about climate smart design, passive ventilation, different materials. We do integrated water management, agroforestry that increases agricultural output, but also increases biodiversity um, and native species um, resiliency built into the system. On a kind of uh, agricultural scale, it looks like taking you know, monoculture cropping into a more diversified system that has more resiliency to it and more production per square meter. Uh, in material choices, we all have material choices, whether we're designers, whether we're in construction, whether you're the operations manager, whether you're somewhere in the decision making of an organization, um, there are small choices that can be made that add up to big things. And so this is one choice, for example, a roof here, you have a choice between a typical steel sheeting roof or um, on the right are clay tiles. The steel sheeting has a high ecological footprint, um, high energy footprint. It has to come from far away. Jobs are produced far away to the job site. On the right is a material that's here and it's fired by agricultural waste um, and creating jobs locally and using local materials. The walls themselves, um, they're on the left are concrete blocks, which also have a high footprint. Um, bricks in this situation um, also did not make sense because bricks need to be fired. And in this particular part of the country, um, the, the, the deforestation rate is high. And so therefore, if we wanted bricks for a construction project, we were exacerbating a deforestation problem. Um, and so what we ended up at was using um, compressed earth block and rammed earth walls, which is again, utilizing the material, the soil itself, mixing in concrete um, and um, creating a, a structural building material out of the earth. Drains, we, um, you know, it's a, a simple thing everybody needs. Um, on the left, you have typical concrete block. On the right, it's a bioswale. That bioswale does everything from slowing water down, filtering, because the bottom of this is a lake that people take drinking water out of. Um, it, it increases um, biodiversity, provides habitat. So you're, you're stacking different uses. Um, and ecologically, um, we can make small moves. Again, it's about little by little makes a system. On the right is our apex ecosystem. And on the left is what it all relies on. You can see here all these, all these gray lines are, are systems that rely on each other and different animals that rely on each other. And if you trace them back, something like papyrus has a huge impact. So how can we today plant these few plants that then set up for success um, of a more resilient ecosystem down the road? And together, this all ties into systems. So this was a project, the Rwanda Institute for Conservation and Agriculture in Rwanda, um, at the, a project with Howard G. Buffett Foundation and the government of Rwanda. This is a whole campus which it, the curriculum and the physical design are based on the concept of One Health. So a decision is not made for one, you know, to improve ecological health, but at the cost of human health or vice versa. So all of our decisions had to stack and had to had to improve the health of each of those aspects um, in every step made. And how do you take that and, and design? How do you make choices? On the left are the different filters. So if you're making a choice, say about drainage, you can think about just human health, you might end up with a storm sewer. Uh, just ecological health, you might end up with a wetland, just animal health, maybe a rain garden for the butterfly garden. Um, on the right is thinking more systemically, one health integrated systemic approach. If you want to make choices that check all the boxes. So a bioswale, for example, filters water so that it doesn't, it doesn't contaminate a water source. It provides infiltration, climate moderation, reduces CO2 footprints by avoiding concrete. It provides habitat for um, native flora and fauna. So you're really stacking up, you're, you're still accomplishing the same thing as on the left, you're draining a system, but you're accomplishing human ecological and animal health as an integrated system. 
And then you can look at that as a small piece, um, but if you can add that up bit by bit, say influence your local or national policy, um, you can add exponential benefit by a square meter by square meter intervention. Uh, thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Jesse Flynn, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about One Health anytime. Um, feel free to send me an email, and I would be happy to talk to you. Thank you for participating this evening. And um, because I feel like it's incredibly awkward to leave an amazing presentation like that without at least one question. Um, so, Jesse, I don't know if we have you on audio. Do we? <laughs> oh, amazing. We do. Good evening. Uh, yes. Good morning. Good afternoon. So there was actually, <laughs> I, I said that I was going to save all the questions for the end, but why not just, we'll get one in if they're out there. Um, so there's a lot of people asking for your presentation. Maybe we'll have to do a follow-up afterwards. Um, but one question that came up already was from Christina. Um, she's part of the alumni council with me. And uh, she asked uh, about population control in your presentation. There was that striking visual where we start to see that land is filled yet population still rising, right? Um, so I guess it's a question about um, what is your, um, what is in your control, what is out of your control, and how do you respond to something like population? Right, well, that's something that obviously is outside of my control. And, and, and as panels that were earlier today talked about um, in terms of working, you know, who are we as designers to tell other people what to do, right? Where where the tool to be able to help other communities accomplish what they want to. So. Things like population control, what, around the world, this is something that we're putting too much pressure on the face of the earth, right? And, and we can only do so much every day. So I think that my role as a designer in this particular case is we, we know what the stats are. We know that the population is doubling. Um, and so how do we make sure that that happens sustainably? Um, and so therefore talking about how do we intensify and diversify every square meter of land? because there's a lot of inefficiencies just in kind of typical land use patterns around the world. So how do we work on that aspect? Um, you know, it's because things like population are definitely outside of my control. So one health design is the way that um, I want to make sure that populations are healthy and are sustainable um, and are able to, to go what and do whatever that they want to do. Um, I don't, sorry, I don't know if I'm on mute or you are, I'm not able to hear you. Better. Nickel snafus, that's not the worst, uh, <laughs> especially when the moderator does it. Um, so we'll, we'll, if we have more questions from the audience as we do these presentations one by one, we'll try to hit out one at the end of them, but we'll collect the rest for the end. So feel free to keep asking questions. Um, we'll move on to our second presentation. This is coming from Phil Dunn, um, who's joining us from Beijing at the moment. Hi, Phil. Um, and Phil was born in 1980 in Hudson, New York, USA. Uh, upon graduating valedictorian from, uh, uh, with a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the BAC in 2006, Phil was awarded the John Worthington Ames Scholarship, which afforded him the ability to actually travel to China. Um, and thanks for the John Worthington Ames Scholarship, Phil was able to travel throughout urban and rural China in search of the great surviving specimens of Chinese traditional vernacular architecture. And keeping in mind a constant comparison between the mass construction happening in China prior to the 2008 Olympics, Phil focused his examination of Chinese architecture on the traditional, sketching and photographing the wood structures, stonework, carving, and latticework that create the dreamlike spaces of historic China. The in-depth study provided Phil with an abundant new arsenal of design ideas and techniques. I'm going to steal that from a history class, Phil. I love it. After traveling China for almost six months, Phil uh, settled in Beijing in late 2006 and began working for internationally recognized contemporary Chinese artist Ai Weiwei at Fake Design. During his four years at Fake, Phil was the project architect on numerous architectural and interior projects in Asia and Europe. Awesome. After leaving Fake Design, Phil formed NAO in 2010. And Phil, Phil Dunn's NAO is a restaurant and bar focused uh, design studio based in Asia undertaking international projects and creating destination restaurants and bars that shape the social scenes of cities. With his six person team, Phil has realized over 60 restaurant, cafe and bar design projects in China. 
At NAO, there is a strong belief in the potential of every project's vision and an understanding of the spirit and uniqueness behind each idea. Take it away, Phil. Unmute first, though. Phil? Yeah, is my audio working? Working. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, as I said, in retrospect, I should have made that bio easier for you to get through. Um, okay, I guess uh, ha being that I, that I focus on bar and restaurant design, I, I'm going to make sort of that the focus. It also looks like he's frozen. So, um, Andres, I might put you on the spot. <laughs> we'll come back to Phil in a second. Fine by me, no problem. <laughs> so, well, there, there oh, is. <laughs> Phil, do you go ahead and try out the audio? I think we got. Okay, you back now. I apologize. The internet's not working. Perfect. Well here. Um, good. All right. Uh, I guess I get started from the beginning again. Um, you know, it's kind of a grand heading, this idea of global response and, and, uh, and being just, you know, someone who focuses primarily on, on sort of the, on bars and restaurants and, and creating kind of, um, social spaces. Um, I'm going to really just talk about sort of the, uh, my personal perspective, um, and how I've, we've responded as a design studio, um, and how, um, you know, you know, how, how creating these kind of luxury spaces, um, and these, this luxury experience for people has um, <clears throat> uh, maybe doesn't fall feel like it falls under this idea of a global response to, to a world pandemic um, or to a global pandemic, but I think it does affect sort of pe um, people's kind of psychological and emotional well-being to, um, you know, I, I think anybody who's had to stay at home or been in, in kind of some kind of quarantine um, of late can attest to sort of that that need for for gathering and that need for for coming together um, and for socializing. Um, so, um, I have a PDF. I guess is that something I should share in the the handouts here? Okay. Do you talk um, all We can we can kind of go through that simultaneously with this talk. Um, but basically, you know. Um, being in China, I, was, I guess I was part of sort of, I got to see the, the early stages of this pandemic, um, you know, when it was kind of uh, just a, a, a Chinese problem initially, um, or seemingly so. Um, and w we had just kind of all taken this annual break for Chinese New Year, and um, which, which becomes a time where, you know, most of the migratory labor force in China goes home. Um, so, you know, construction projects are all on hold and, and uh, typically on hold for a three week to a one month period. And um, and so we were already in this kind of this this sort of temporary lull. Um, and then you had this kind of rising pandemic, um, which then, uh, you know, didn't allow staff to come back to work, didn't allow um, construction to, to start again. And um, and so that was sort of the background of, of how we uh, Kind of enter these uncharted waters and and find you know had to find a way to sort of navigate this un the unexpected problems, um, and uh, yeah. So then sort of moving on, um, you know the, the first kind of image is just you know when this was really just a sort of a China focused problem and you, you know you're getting your phone calls from your family and friends asking you know if you're okay and what's happening and 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 it really. Uh, seemed like a, a foreign problem for most of the world, and now it's it's very different than that. Um, uh, in many ways, the tables have turned dramatically. Um, <clears throat> but so one of the early impacted industries was the food and beverage industry, because after coming out of Chinese New Year, when they all wanted to open back up and, and were expecting to to um, to you know have a new flourishing business post Chinese New Year, um, these kind of you know 
vacancies um, started <coughs> developing. Um, you had these kind of popular locations um, in well curated shopping malls and such where, where business was was not allowed to take place. And so these people, uh, these companies were going out of business and that then allowed for vacancies for new companies to come in who um, who were able to weather the storm. And so it, it, when you, you know, looking back at sort of February and March and April in China, um, times where you thought like business would be bad, it actually started booming because a lot of these kind of restaurant and, and bar uh, brands were, were, were taking the opportunity and taking the risks to, to move into um, <clears throat> some of these uh, opportunities in larger malls and shopping centers and office buildings. Um, uh, some of the initial problems we had to look at was was uh, that we, you know, were sort of uncharted waters. As I said, was things like staff returning to work. Um, I had, you know, staff coming back. I had to deliver computers to their houses so they could do their two weeks quarantine. Um, we I had a whole team of contractors that were based in Hubei, which is where the the disease um, was was uh, most prominent, um, and. Uh, they were they were locked down for almost a three month period before being able to restart con the, the construction that we had started prior to Chinese New Year, um, you know. So just just kind of a daily adjusting to things that you didn't expect and, and um, was sort of part of the early early onset of this pandemic. Um, I guess then moving on to sort of some of the initial problems about interior space and interior design. Um, you see some of these images in the next slide. Um, which are, you know, initial uh, kind of responses to having to have limited uh, limited seating in your restaurants or to create these kind of partitions. And so, you know, when we had some of these new projects developing in, in February and in March um, coming to the table, people had different perspectives about how they would want layouts. Um, you know, they, they didn't want to talk about communal tables and, and um, large private rooms. They wanted a lot of, you know, sort of two person tables, um, a lot of flexibility, um, a lot more in a lot of focus on sort of outdoor seating. Um, so those were some of the new sort of discussion points that uh, that came out of out of um, this, this pandemic. Um, I guess so. Yeah, the next point is, is something I guess I was just touching on, which is sort of solutions through design. Um, you know, how do we how do we solve these problems and how do we do it in an aesthetically pleasing way? Um, and, uh, and so those were, those are really sort of the discussion points that, um, <clears throat> we, we, uh, focused on in some of these, uh, projects coming at, uh, post pandemic. Um, how do we circulate air more effectively? Uh, how do we focus more on, on exterior spaces? Uh, how do we create, uh, more seating for smaller groups? Um, and more distance in the space without losing a lot of seating, um, which in turn means losing income. Um, uh, I, I would say more importantly were some of the solutions that came through technology. Um, you know, China's been on the forefront, I, um, as I'm sure a lot of people in, have have seen in the news through the last few months. But um, you know, China with its uh, previous responses to SARS. Um, had some had quite a lot of experience in this, um, and and that the, they were, you know, being a powerful sort of authoritarian country, they they um, were able to respond quite strongly to this pandemic. And there's been some great development in in sort of data collection, whether you see it as a great development or not. Um, in, you know, in terms of uh, using you know mobile devices to to scan QR codes and to keep um, keep tabs of of where people have been. Um, but uh, and allow you to to then enter cities and enter building complexes based on your sort of your health status and your QR readouts. Um, so that's that's been a great way to sort of allow play, people to to come back out and socialize and feel safe. Um, uh, and so, as the, as some of the the pandemics gotten under control in China and the um, and we started looking at ways to to socialize safely, um, and uh, <clears throat> there was this kind of like, you know, what is this return to normal? How do we return to normal? Um, what sacrifices are we willing to make to to sort of um, to go back out and get that kind of psychological and emotional well-being that comes with socializing? 
Um, and uh, and <clears throat> some of that has had to come through um, through slightly different ways of, of coming together. And there's this kind of great image that, that uh, was circulating, um, at least in Chinese social media, which was um, which appealed to me, uh, which I think if you keep going down through the, the, the PDF there is an early kind of archaeological uh, architectural site meeting and you have all these people huddled around a blueprint covered in plastic. Um, I think if you keep going down, you'll, you'll come to that image. Um, but uh, I thought that was kind of a, you know, one, because it, it talked to our profession and two, just because it was sort of like a real. Um, very real scenario, but where people were trying to get back to work and, and kind of, but trying to do it safely. Um, anyway, I think it's kind of to sort of to, to summarize some of the points and tangents I've been on for the last few minutes. Um, you know, I think technology has really been the, the one thing that's allowed uh, people to come back together um, and uh, being able to, to test people properly and to, um, to have these kind of uh, data collections and, and mobile uh, QR code solutions um, ha has been great in letting people come together. And I, and I guess that puts being it as I'm not someone developing that technology, what I, what I've been able to do, I think it, to sort of, to respond, um, to this pandemic is to cre kind of create these, these dreams, you know, people, people are unable to travel right now. People are limited in, in where they can go. And so they want, they want to have these kind of destinations. They want to have these kind of dream spaces and these escapes. And so uh, one of the points that's been coming up in a lot of discussion in the last sort of early design concept meetings is, is, you know, how do we how do we create a space where people feel like they've gotten out of Beijing or they've gotten out of Shanghai or they're out of China? Um, so I have a couple images here of a place that opened up last night that I've been working on the last few months. Um, and it's this is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of this Moroccan roof terrace experience. And uh, um, last night was sort of it was the opening and, and uh, there was about 200 people on this roof and nobody wearing masks and, and it kind of was a it's nice to see that there's this um this return to gathering and and gathering in a way that feels safe and and doesn't feel like a health risk um you know we all had to go through uh registration and and we had to scan qr codes to get up on this roof um we had to show that you know where we had traveled in the last 14 days etc but once you're up there you have this feeling that you can you can now you know sort of return to normal um so i guess in conclusion this is sort of um maybe maybe china is in, in one of the better situations globally right now um and has come out of this pandemic in a, uh in a <coughs> positively um and uh and so i guess i hope that that gives a little bit of a sense of a light at the end of the tunnel to to people in, who might be in other countries around the world where that they haven't quite got to that that uh, sort of stage yet um so that's that's about what i have to say and i hope i address some of these points of global response thank you okay okay you know, I, I, you alluded to something I was going to say later, which is this panel has been billed as uh, the global response team and designers to the rescue. And, you know, at first I thought that that was um, some awfully heady superhero like shoes to fill uh, for you all. You know, but the funny thing is um, restaurants, bars, uh, and these are the public settings for so many of our cherished social interactions across all borders, across all countries. Um, and in many ways, it's one of the spaces that people touch most frequently um, in terms of architectural impact. So um, I guess, you know, don't sell yourself short there. Um, I also have 12 years of bartending underneath my um, suspenders. So I have a belief in the industry, but I'm also concerned. So I guess my quick question for you before we continue along is, um, are you seeing that your clients are proactively attempting to address new business models? Um, have you seen a fallout um, what's the prognosis for restaurants and bars moving forward, at least in China? Um, I mean, I think one one great thing that's happened recently is, um, and, I, and we talked about this a couple of days ago in our first discussion, um, but we didn't have the audience, is that um, you know, there's been a, um, 
there was some real limitations in China about outdoor seating, especially in Beijing. They were trying to clean up the, the kind of streetscapes um, and, and force everybody sort of inside. Um, and uh, and uh, this COVID, COVID has really changed people's perspective about that and changed even the government's perspective. And they, there was a meeting uh, last week or 10 days ago in, in Beijing with, um, uh, you know, at the highest government levels, and they decided to, to adjust that policy. And that's a response to COVID. Um, and, that, and I think that, that will change um, uh, people's business model to some degree that you'll be, you know, people were, were forced to, to base their business models on, on only interior seating. And now you get these, this chance to, to uh, spill back out onto the streets. Um, and, and I think it also, that changes the cityscape. I mean, I, I uh, have fond memories of the Beijing I first came to 14 years ago where there was outdoor seating everywhere. And, and um, and that's that's uh, been lost over the last three or four years, and it's, I'm glad to see that coming back. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, t there's also kind of a, a history uh, history in China of wanting to have private rooms um, in restaurants, and that's that's a real sort of cultural um, focus for for restaurant design. I think people are really they've been getting away from that anyway, and going to sort of more. Um, of an open seating plan, uh, but I think that this this is going to encourage that even more. I hope I answered your question there to some degree. Awesome. Yes, absolutely. And there's more questions coming, so I'm just going to piggy bank and keep going until we get to those. Um, so Andres Moreira is next. Um, he is an Ecuadorian architect who got his bachelor's degree in Ecuador at Universidad Tecnica Particular de Loja, uh, Ecuador, which is also a licensed title. Um, so he's been practicing since 2009 and got his master's at the BAC in 2017. Um, he's currently the founder of the collaborative studio A359, uh, along with Carolina Bravo, uh, Valeria Pineda, and Pineda? I don't know if it's an and, and yeah, and Pablo Rodriguez. Uh, we run a design firm uh, built and focused on active research, and we have a large commitment to cultural development. We is he, not me. <laughs> so, Andres, take it away. Awesome. Thanks for the introduction. I made it quick so I can speak more about the presentation. So, <laughs> uh, before starting, it's really good to hear uh, uh, Jesse and Phil's approach uh, about interior and landscape because uh, it's funny that it, en it ended up being that way. Uh, uh, each one of us talking about uh, different things. Uh, well, this is the name of our studio, in case you're wondering. The 359 is because of the latitude of our city, Loja. It's in the southern hemisphere. So, yeah. Uh, in the next slide, you can probably see our uh, Instagram page. So, you can follow us. Uh, we do some work there. And uh, to begin with the presentation, uh, so I want to say that uh, this is a way to frame our reality, right? We haven't had any pandemics of this type, uh, as you will see in the next slide. Uh, so this is how we see the world and this is how uh, we're trying to approach this. Uh, so the first part, it's called from, a, it's a grim approach to the COVID, but what we can get from it. So first of all, uh, uh, it was very interesting to see how um, the world starts getting smaller and smaller, even though we live in a globalized world. But uh, we saw the whole world, then we were worried about our own country, then we got worried about our, you know, our cities, and then especially about our neighborhoods. So it's been a, a good way to be uh, aware of everything that's happening around us, uh, because the COVID is a really big uh, deal all around the world. Uh, well, as we can, Keep moving forward. Um, uh, this was uh, from a design point of view. Uh, as you can see, these two graphics. This is what the government showed us about uh, COVID numbers uh, from the beginning. In the left, you can see the first one, the first uh, report they gave us. You see, we had uh, 37 positive cases. Uh, in the right, we can see the new one. And it's interesting to see how the design has changed also uh, for the government and. Also, people have learned to read the information better. So this is uh, what we've been dealing with every day, uh, every day infographics and learning how to read data. Well, uh, as we move forward, uh, of course, uh, if you've 
seen the news from Ecuador uh, uh, in the next slide, uh, we will see uh, some of the reality of what we're dealing with. Of course, uh, one of the recommendations, everyone says the World Organization, Health Organization tells you to be social distancing, but there are places where people can't live like that. Uh, they have to live together. I mean, they live in really uh, hot weather, so they have to live in community. And this is why one of the reasons why uh, the spread was so big in so many of the cities here in Ecuador. But uh, the thing is that uh, community is a big thing here. So uh, even though there was a lot of uh, people who got who who got the COVID, uh, they still try to live uh, a community living. Uh, as we move forward uh, with the next slide, uh, uh, this is one of my favorite pictures I found when I was going through the the presentation. So this is our new reality. This is Quito. Usually Quito is a really busy city. But I love to see this uh, image, even though everyone's wearing a mask, but uh, people uh, flooding the streets, right? Uh, and being the owners of the streets without cars. Uh, we can keep going uh, forward. And the other important thing that has happened is that, uh, well, we do deal with uh, things that happen in our government, right? Uh, we do have to deal with uh, corruption. There have been really awful cases of people uh, using people's money for their own interest during this time. So it's been a really uh, devastating time for us emotionally and even trusting the government. And of course, you know, there's people we, we've had income of immigration, but they're leaving the country. So it's been a whole mess for for us, even for the pandemic, economically and, so, and socially. Uh, well, you can keep moving forward, please. Uh, another big problem is uh, education. I mean, for us educators, uh, this is a big uh, design challenge because uh, even though there's so much education in the world, so much technology in the world, uh, not everyone has the same access to education. So we have to figure out a way to keep this uh, uh, to, to keep this going. I mean, this will be uh, these people will be the problem solvers of the future. So. Uh, this pandemic has been a really good opportunity to uh, think about how to teach uh, either architecture or any other uh, science and just how to teach uh, children. Uh, okay, as we can move forward, um, some other things that have worried me, uh, as I was telling you at the beginning, most of this is my opinion of how I've seen this crisis is that there, uh, there is a big approach to human health, of course, because of the COVID and what it does. But uh, uh, mental health has not never been a really big issue for people. And I think that's something that hit us really hard. As I was telling you, it's been very sad moments, you know, lonely moments. And, you know, we're not getting too much help from our government. Uh, so things keep getting worse, right? <laughs> but we'll see the optimistic part uh, after. And as we move forward, uh, so this is very interesting because I don't know if you guys heard about this. Uh, this is the epidemiology uh, traffic light. This is the way the government tried to move us uh, from a red state, as you can see uh, to the left, where we had no permission to go outside. We had really tough curfews. And then uh, as a street light with red, yellow, and green, they started uh, allowing us to move, uh, to move around the city, to go to different places, for restaurants to open. And it's been a really slow way to do it. And it's been done by uh, each mayor of the city. Uh, at the beginning of the crisis, everything was managed by the government, uh, the president and his government. And now it's managed by each city mayor. OK, so yeah, that was very interesting. And well, we're talking about construction because our CISA design build firm, uh, there has been a lot of lobbying uh, to keep moving construction. Uh, and actually, they managed to do it because even though we were in a red state, in a red light, uh, construction moved, moved forward. But as you can see in the next slide, uh, it was kind of sad to see that, uh, okay, they can see people uh, having, I mean, check people for having uh, COVID. But uh, in the next slide, you see that the conditions of the workers haven't really changed. I mean, it's like uh, they don't have too much security. And maybe this is a good time so we can change all of that. Hopefully, all this movement of uh, different construction companies, I mean, and for the government uh, to be more uh, severe about construction. Okay, 
So that's the part of the green part, right? So now we're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, some optimism, right? Because not everything is uh, like so grim uh, for COVID, even though it's something really bad that happened, right? So in the next slide, you'll see something that happened everywhere around the world. You'd see some popular people trying to sing uh, to, uh, to everyone uh, through online concerts. You know, to the right, it's our one of our former presidents and he's actually a physical education teacher. So he has some YouTube videos teaching people how to exercise at home. So uh, this is just some example of people trying to give uh, some happiness to, to people. Uh, well, as we can give, uh, uh, move forward. Uh, this one was probably one of the favorite things that happened uh, that happened with with COVID. That it's uh, the barter. I love the the name in Spanish. It's called trueque, right? It's the uh, activity of exchanging one good with another good. So you get uh, you don't use money, and it's been one of the best ways to generate economy. You know, to recycle things you don't need and acquire things you need uh, through these hard times. You know, because People have been losing jobs. People are not able to go to their work. A lot of people have been laid off. So you have to ha to use what you have uh, so you can keep moving the economy. Okay, and then uh, the other thing, uh, how people have used their craftsmanship uh, to make a good thing out of, the cr out of the crisis, right? You see a lot of people who used to make school uniforms that now they make uniforms for, for people who work in health, right? Uh, to the right, uh, you can see people who are like making monsters out of the COVID that, you know, they can be used as toys. And in the next slide, you will see uh, how people are using, you know, they're learning, they're learning basic skills uh, that we probably have forgotten, right? How to cook, uh, how to make our own pottery, how to make, make our, our, our own paintings. And that's something good that's coming out of the crisis, right? And uh, these with the, with the barter have been like awesome things uh, about creating communities, you see. So from the beginning, I was talking about a globalized world and now we're thinking so much about our, na our neighbor, our, about, about the people who live next to us. So uh, these are the good things that have happened. Uh, well, uh, you can keep moving forward, please. And it, as uh, Jesse was talking, uh, this is also a big thing. Uh, people here are like really, um, they're really dependent on physical money, right? Uh, so it's a symbol of trust to have the bills, right? To have the coins. And it's been really hard for people to forget about this. Uh, and COVID pretty much has taught us to, you know, use digital currency uh, to make our goods. And, you know, as you can see, there's been new delivery methods. Uh, no one has really, it's not about just food, they bring you stuff, they bring you your groceries. So uh, the network of community has grown a lot. Um, okay, and uh, the other thing that has grown, has grown a lot is the community of knowledge. And I'm really happy about this because people are showing uh, not only through YouTube, uh, because we know you can, we can find anything online, right? But this, uh, these are seminars done by people in our own uh, community in our own medium who are trying to teach you about how to do things or they can learn from you I mean, the same as we're doing now we're learning from everyone in the world how to do uh, how to deal with the crisis and then um, the other awesome thing that happened uh, within the within my city is that it is a small city right and uh, we've always had these bicycle lanes uh, but no one really respected them and during the red uh, time of the uh, the traffic light, as I was telling you, there was a lot of traffic restriction. So a lot of people started using bikes and now it's amazing how many people use bikes. And then uh, the city hall, uh, they started making them better. Now they're improving them. Uh, in the next slide, you will see all these meant just like a big breath to the world. Uh, uh, it's been awesome to leave the city without cars for a while. Uh, well, you can go to the next slide. And it's very interesting when I talk about, I use this, uh, uh, this road every day, either for running or the bicycle. And it's very funny, I keep comparing it to the emerald green necklace, right? Because it, this uh, cycle uh, way, it connects all the parks in the city. So it's pretty awesome. Okay, so uh, for the, in the last part, uh, I'm gonna talk about our practice, right? Uh, this is what we did for design before. 
during and after COVID. And uh, I'll, I'll explain it. This first slide talks about what's common construction here, right? To the upper left, you see informal construction, you see people building, you see so close to the, you know, to the light, uh, to the light poles, you know, and that's illegal, right? Most of the people also leave uh, empty spaces in the top of the house, their houses, so they can have a space for their children. And also you see as uh, in the bottom left uh, picture, uh, they don't leave any open space. So most of our city looks like you can see in the right, you see just windows and walls and just uh, spaces for parking. And when I did a Google search, uh, as you can see in the next image for houses here in my city, uh, it's the same thing, right? You see, it's a really condensed city. Uh, it's a very uh, condensed uh, skyline to call it that way, right? You see, because there's no greenery, everyone seems to be living inside. And it's very sad because as you will see in the next slide, uh, our uh, this is our vernacular uh, construction, right? This is what our history looks like with a lot of balconies, huge doors that would allow you to go to uh, inner patios. And uh, all of this has been lost. I mean, you know, we've been going through modernity. So one of these vernacular things is what we've been trying to do with architecture, with our practice. So in the next slide, I will show you one. This is a uh, this, this was very interesting because this was a client we had uh, we we started working with him two weeks before uh, the COVID COVID started. So this is the location of the house. You see, most of our city looks like this. We have some mountain mountains. We live in a valley. So his desire was to fill the whole space. He wanted a uh, hundred percent to use the space the most as possible, as you will see in the next slide. So uh, we didn't get to talk to him for like three weeks. So. Uh, while the pandemic was, was going and then when we got to talk to him he was like okay maybe we do we do need open spaces maybe we do need a uh, balconies maybe we do need more windows and actually uh, his mentality changed and as you will see in the next slide this is one of the uh, projects we're working with him you know it has a lot of balconies uh, a lot of landscape and it's very open so that's what we try to do in in, in our in our designs and uh, to conclude with this, I mean, I have some a, a series of images and uh, you can keep going. Uh, these are some of the projects we've worked as a, oh, these are the house plans. You see it ended up being a lot about the balconies and open to, to, uh, to the outside. So uh, as you can see, this is our urban context, right? It's a very, it's a dense city, not very dense. There are not large buildings, but uh, what we wanted to show you here is that uh, how interesting and flexible architecture is, see? Uh, right. <laughs> so, for example, uh, we as architects, we plan something and during these times, uh, you will see as you can keep forward going for forward with the presentation. Oh, so we, this is all the design we do. I mean, the design decisions we take to, uh, to end up having a, a final project, right, as you can see the plans. And then in the next slide, you see the pictures of what we want to show, right? So this is how we want architecture to look. You will see in the next slide the same thing. Uh, how this this is how we designers uh, decide this to work but then uh, we asked all our clients from these houses to send us pictures uh, from this time uh, during covid and it's amazing to see how they use the space i mean how flexible uh, they managed to make it they managed to make it and as you can see places that were uh, this is one of uh, as you can see in the right picture this is one of our favorite uh, if you can go back please just one yeah this uh, this wall here we uh, when we talked to the clients we really wanted it to be a, a wall that will have a really amazing painting and as you can see it has been filled with pictures of their children and it's awesome i mean i that's something great about architecture <laughs> and uh, it's a very flexible house and they managed to live really well there. <laughs> uh, in the next project, uh, you will see, we try to bring some of the vernacular concepts here. Um, as you will see uh, in the next slide, uh, uh, there's a lot of greenery and we left an open space in the middle. Uh, and we have like, a, this is a big, this is a rather large house, but uh, we, own, we have this re really big connection with, with, with the landscape, right? Within and without type. And even though right now you will see in some of the pictures that it has a beautiful view to the outside, 
we always wanted uh, the house to be lived to the inside. And as, again, as you will see, these are the pictures we took, you see, with the perfect light, uh, with the perfect angles to show a lot of what we want to show uh, of architecture. You can keep moving forward, uh, different activities happening. And then we ask them to take the pictures and this is how they're using the space, you know. You see these small holes to play, uh, these really corners so they can read. Uh, you see uh, people enjoying the environment and as you can, you can move forward. Also, uh, people sharing the kitchen and learning how to cook and also uh, creating their own gyms. So it's pretty awesome what uh, people can do with architecture and space. And in the last project, uh, this is uh, a project that it's very real. It, it has a lot of relation with nature. Uh, what happened is uh, the owner of the, this house is a doctor. Um, uh, she's a doctor and uh, as you can see, these are some of the diagrams of, of how we came with uh, the design of this house uh, that it has once again, a lot of connection with nature. And uh, if you can, well, probably it's going to take a while because the next slide was really heavy. Yeah, uh, you see it, uh, we have some green roofs and the houses lived all in the upside. And then we'll see some pictures of, we, of what we wanted to show uh, in the next slide. Uh, yeah, like a huge connection to nature and even respecting it. And this was very important for us to respect nature. This is what we've been trying to do in all the projects. I mean, when I told you about the, uh, yeah, uh, I, I told you before about how important nature is to us. And you see it has two patios and, well, these are the architectural pictures again, where everything looks great. And it's amazing then how she changed the space, uh, as you will see next. So it can fit uh, here. Uh, this is just a picture from the front. So you can see the whole front yard and how it has, I mean, like it, it, within the city, it looks like a totally different landscape. And in the next pictures, we will see uh, how she's using the space now, right? Uh, she put all her working machine, machines there. You see the Orbitrex over there. She has like a really nice uh, desk there. She has a yoga mat here. So it's, very nice to see people using their houses and so this house uh, it's owned by my sister and actually before covid uh, this one was of the this was one of the ro the rooms she used the less because she has a tv inside her uh, in her bedroom but now it seems to be the room that's been more used and the other thing that you will see in the last picture that it has been common for most of the houses uh, this type of setups uh, when you go into a into a house you will find these setups, uh, tables with different shoes, so you can change them, uh, so you can wash your hands, you can leave your masks and change your clothes because, I mean, we have to protect each other. So uh, as a conclusion for all of this, uh, I made three conclusions that even though as grim as COVID has been, it has been painful for us and all the world, and you will see that in the last slide, uh, it, has meant a change of mentality, uh, not only for us as designers uh, to be more aware of the environment, but also for the clients. So this gave us more hopes. I mean, it's really awesome to hear uh, uh, now that we talk to clients, they are more excited about their spaces, what we can propose to them, how open their houses will be. I mean, now they want balconies, they want a lot of green space. So it will be really awesome for us. It, it will leave us a lot of great opportunities. And the other great thing, it has been the community. I mean, and I, I called it community enhancement because I do think there is community, but this has made it grow even more. So, yep, that's, those are some thoughts about our practice and how we are dealing with COVID and how we'll probably keep moving forward with it. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> oh, and the applause from the crowd. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hear it, but I can see <laughs> we can see them. <laughs> 51. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, audience, I'm <laughs> you're yeah. done with the wall of applause, which is fantastic, <laughs> by the way. That's almost more exciting than sound to me. Yeah, but um, you see, this is, this is really awesome for us because we do want to hear ev what's happening with everyone in the world. I mean, we don't, I mean, sometimes we get news from, you know, B, everything that's going big in the world, but not what 
we are doing and everyone was happy to hear about what's going on in the world so yeah this is <laughs> hope everything's great <laughs> fantastic um so i invite the audience to um pose up any uh, additional questions you have for the group um i'll i'll start one that i have um that I'd, I'd love everyone to answer briefly while you all you know um go ahead and offer up any of the questions that you've had um, during the presentation or uh, maybe for one panelist or maybe for everyone. Um, but I, I, you know, I'm beyond impressed, uh, first off, by the sense of kind of agency that you all embody. Um, you illustrate how design is on the front lines of any shift in society. Um, I said earlier that I love architecture and design because it's where ideas really get translated into physical space and they actually become tangible. Um, and often you have to do these things before there's a consensus on how to proceed. Um, so many of our assumptions about the world um, and the way that it operates have been questioned over the past few months. Our social, behavioral, our economic patterns, some of them very nearly held are at risk. Um, but in the midst of this kind of unfolding, there's also glimpses of optimism and ingenuity. So my question is, if you had a crystal ball what would you ask it about the post-pandemic world? <laughs> you can go, Phil. I'll start with. Picking <laughs> <laughs> uh, on my feet here. Um, I think it's it's a question that I touched it uh, touched on in my presentation. Just is like, what is what is the new normal going to be? Um, uh, you know. For one big question I have right now is about international travel, and then when are we going to return to to complete flexibility with that? Um, and uh, and yeah, and yeah, I think that's that's maybe my my two major questions: what it, what will the new normal be, and and um, will we be able to maintain this kind of what we had in the past of this kind of international travel, or does that become something that's more virtual? Well, yeah, I think my question would be maybe, I mean, after all this goes away, I mean, did this help us be, became better people with ourselves and with our community? Uh, I would like to know if this taught us uh, anything as a human, human species. I mean, to be better with the world, I'd love to know, <laughs> to know that. <laughs> I hope that the answer is yes, but. <laughs> I feel like a lot of people got to spend a lot more time with themselves and, and, and slow down their lives to some degree that, that it gave a lot of people a new perspective on, on what they find valuable. Um, and uh, and you know, forced a lot of people to, to re, evaluate their priorities. Um, I think for, for the majority of people, we'll all shift right back into our old habits as if we're allowed to, but I think there is a, there's a minority that will, that will, whose lives who, who will really drastically change the, the trajectory of their lives. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you can hear me um, in, I would say if I could look in a crystal ball, I would want to know, have we made the connection of One Health? Do we know that we rely on the earth being a healthy place in order for humans to be healthy and our populations to be healthy? Um, and you know, there are countries doing things like payment for ecosystem services because on a parcel by parcel basis, um, we tend to take care of our immediate needs. But many of these concepts require a watershed, you know, thought or urban kind of uh, community scale. And so that requires cooperation of communities, of oversight of government. Um, and so I. I would ask the crystal ball, have we figured that out and have we changed our relationship um, to nature, whether it's choosing our
I, I, I am, I'm really, I've been writing vigorously every day and um, I'm just really curious to see uh, if this is in fact a pivot, a juncture, or just suggested a pause. Um, so it would be, I, I think, fascinating to see that. And actually to follow up on that question, um, Rudy Nish uh, has, a, has uh, asked a question that I also had in my mind. And I think it always bounces around in our, in our BAC minds because we're, um, we're uh, so engaged with practice. Um, so she wanted to know um, what firms you worked for while you're at the BAC, if you could rattle those off. Um, but also, how is practice most radically different in your country um, compared to practice in the U.S.? Um, and you know, and I'd add on to that. And I, and if you want to go a little further with it, my question was, how do you see practice changing? Um, it's it's a it's a bit more of a continuation, but um, you know, if you could talk briefly about what experience you had in the U.S., um, how it differs with what you have um, on the ground prior to a few months ago and that's where you see things going in sure. terms of your respect, respected practices. Is that for anyone? <laughs> All of you. Okay, so uh... When I was at the VAC, I worked at Sam Architecture. Uh, at that time, it was a small firm. Uh, and then I uh, I finished, when, when I graduated, I worked for Kleinfelder for two years and a half. Uh, it was mostly an engineer firm, but it had its uh, architecture department, and that's where I worked. Uh, the difference in practice, and I think it's very important, and I think that's something that should happen here in Latin America, is the process of becoming an architect uh, that you do need practice. I think practice is important to be an architect and uh, we don't, I mean, pretty much as I was telling you in my biography, once you get your your, uh, your bachelor's degree that allows you to be a licensed architect. So that's very different. And, uh, and what would be going on? I mean, I would guess that probably will people will uh, following Phil and he was asking about uh, uh, traveling, probably people will want to experience spaces more. I mean, I'm pretty sure that anyone who wants to learn architecture or practice architecture will want to experience places. And as soon as the travel ban stops to start moving around to learn and to improve practices through, through learning outside. I can respond to that question as well. Um, I don't know that I recall all the names of the firms I worked for. I worked for quite a few, but I, I worked for Margulies and Associates. I worked for Elkis and Freddie for a little bit. Um, I also worked, uh, but I also worked weekends in the, in the, the club industry around uh, Chinatown area. Um, but yeah, I think the the, the practice was, was in a, you know, a really important part, obviously, of the BAC curriculum. Yeah, and it was really area. important for me. And it, it's something that I really, uh, I like to, you know, get my staff out to the construction sites. Um, you know, new employees, I, I try to get them to see the sites and to understand the, the, the materials that they're actually, you know, what each line means when they when they do a drawing. Um, and uh, and um, I guess the, the biggest differences I would see in terms of, um, you know, working in China versus the time I worked in the U.S. Um, is, is really just the pace, um, and it's you know in many ways it's addictive. But uh, um, the the pace of construction, the pace of projects, the schedules um, is is uh, it's it's very aggressive here. And I think um, when I was visiting the, the BAC in, in the, the last fall, I one thing I, I noted um, or uh, brought up was just that I think that BAC really instilled that kind of work ethic. Um, that allows me to keep up with that pace. Um, so again, I, I thank the BAC for that. Um, and I, when I was at BAC, I, I was not your typical designer. I actually started, I was a state forester for the, for the state when I began at BAC um, and moved into, I worked for Timothy Lee Landscape Design. He's a, um, kind of a high-end residential landscape designer and I worked for Land Escapes uh, design build landscape firm. Um, 
my first experience actually in a like a design firm um, was after I left the BAC, um, I went to go work for a mass design group, which is how I ended up in, in Rwanda. Um, and I'd say that um, the difference between US practice and here is there's there's not that many licensed or experienced designers. There is no landscape architecture program at all in this country. Um, and architecture programs on the continent are few and far between. So um, it's it's both, you know, for the designers that are around, it's a great opportunity because there's, you know, everything you do basically becomes a precedent. Um, but that also carries a lot of weight. Everything you do, you know, becomes a precedent. Um, and so we, you know, there is opportunity. The government here is very open to seeing how things happen and taking the best of and turning that into policy, whether it's healthcare design, ecological uh, design. And so, um, there's a lot of opportunity here to also bring people into the field. I give talks at like the um, at botany classes, and we give talks at different you know the allied professions to try to bring people into the design field um, because there's not a lot of opportunity and precedent for it here. Um, so I'd say that there's a lot for designers that are um, around and that are being trained. There's a lot of opportunity um, to to work with within a system and a government that's very flexible, very progressive, um, and is, you know, we're one of 10 countries in the world that's doing payment for ecosystem services as part of national GDP. So, you know, they're looking for different solutions and new, new ways to approach things. Um, and so design has a real, um, a real big impact in there. really are you know stretching our our conception of the of design practice in a lot of ways um i i wonder if um this is kind of the second part of my question i i, I wonder how or if you feel that um your practice will change as a result of you know the past few months um if you see uh, opportunities barriers or, or just things that you know, make you think a little differently about the way practice um will proceed or should proceed or could proceed um, I'd say at least on the the design that I'm involved in, COVID is proof that One Health is a very real and very urgent need that we need to pay attention to. Um, we designed RECA as the a, a concept, you know, like all of the concepts of One Health are very solid, very based in science. Um, so it was kind of like everybody, when you explain it, says, oh, One Health, this makes sense, let's do it. Um, and then COVID comes along and becomes in our face. You cannot avoid the fact that, you know, a crossover of an ecosystem issue in China has affected each one of us on this call today. Um, and so how do we make sure that we sensitize ourselves to that and that we as designers are conscientious of the resources that we're using, the supply chains that we're creating um, and the, the spaces that, that we're working on land use um, policy. It, for me, it's a, the, what this has changed has just been even more evidence and in some ways, a way that I can relate to people. I can talk about, you know, the reason that you need to wear a mask and you can't visit your mom is because of, you know, One Health. And so it, it gives me at least an entry point to, to help people explain how the built world and the natural world are very integrated. Um, and that's our responsibility as designers to, to explain those connections um, and also to be conscientious of working them into future design. However similarly or differently? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, it has already changed. Uh, as I was mentioned, you, uh, we wanted to show that example of our clients because uh, we, we work directly with clients. So their way of uh, looking at architecture changed. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we live in a place where usually architecture work is not uh, appreciated. Uh, that's the only word I found uh, to say it, right? Because uh, people think that there's more value in the construction than in the design. 
So hopefully with uh, everything that has happened for our uh, profession, um, that uh, that appreciation, I mean, uh, people being more aware of what we do, that we care about their well-being, that uh, we care about their health, I mean, that's the standard of care, I mean, <laughs> and usually people that, uh, didn't appreciate that till recently, so that's a big change for us as uh, that uh, who work directly with clients. I can also touch on that question. Um, although I, I think the effects have been sort of opposite of what I would have expected in many ways. Um, and, uh, and uh, I think a lot of people are, you know, came off of sort of these, this kind of slow period with a lot of um, time at home and, and, um, and in a way they've kind of, reacted reversely and I, they're sort of exploding onto um, uh, in, in trying to develop their business and and being unable to travel at this point and being unable to do a lot of the um, things that people like to do socially prior to this pandemic people are sort of really just putting their nose to the grindstone and and, and uh, working so I feel like there's a you know a lot of new projects that um, and almost more than that there's been in the past and and um, and I think that uh, um, you know, maybe budgets are a little bit tighter because people have, uh, you know, are, did have that that couple month period with with huge revenue losses. Um, but uh, you know, people are are still willing to take the risks and 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 uh, and to move forward and to to work hard. Um, I feel like those are the those have been the the kind of trends of the last couple months for sure here. that um, Phil kind of answered in chat if you've been following along a little bit. Um, but I'll offer it up to uh, the rest of the panelists also and with a, a slight twist. Um, Rand asked, you know, it's, it's interesting to see a rich blend of high and low tech solutions to the pandemic from fold out, don't sit here signs to QR code linked contact tracing. Do you find a difference in the psychological or societal responses to those? Are both methods seen in all social strata? So I'll just tweak that a little bit and say, you know, are you seeing distinctions between how this virus um, and its repercussions are playing out um, amongst uh, different strata in society? Um, is it affecting, um, you know, different demographics, um, economic or otherwise, uh, different in um, or in different ways? I know it's deep. Okay, so uh, I have a, um, it, this is a, um, something that's happened uh, here in Rwanda. One of the universities <clears throat> I teach, there uh, is a I difference teach, in special. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll just do this, do this really quickly. So, uh, exactly. So, uh, Gensler gave us a talk about uh, technology in, you know, working spaces. And they were talking about, you know, voice controlled uh, elevators, and they were talking about all these magnificent, you know, uh, retina scanners and everything that you don't need to touch anything. Uh, so it was very shocking for us uh, about, uh, because that's something that would be really hard to have here in our country. I mean, even for high standard, for, uh, like you were saying, for different, uh, uh, I mean, for, for different, different societies. Uh, technology, uh, unfortunately, I don't think in our in our uh, place is one of the best ways to combat COVID. COVID, uh, because of the we don't have too much uh, access to it, and it's very expensive. And yeah, unfortunately, we don't have. Uh, I mean, it's it's not a it's not one of the big game changers after COVID. Uh, you can hear me. I think my internet's being a bit glitchy. 
Um, Wanda, there's um, most of the response is very analog. Um, there's radio, re uh, the, the way, um, and so that is, I would say the way that the government is getting a lot of information out. There's even, there's drones that are being used that carry a loudspeaker and they fly them over communities to make announcements. Um, there's also, we have Zipline here. It's a drone delivery service for emergency blood delivery and things. Um, and then we also have robots that are actually treating the COVID patients. So things that, so that a healthcare worker doesn't need to go into a room with somebody who's infected, they actually send a robot in for things like temperature checks or delivery of food. Um, and so while the average Rwandan is receiving news through you know, the daily announcements on the radio, there's also some very high tech responses at the same time um, because, and you know, internet isn't, isn't accessible everywhere. And as you know, as you can see, isn't that, reliable and steady. Um, so Rwanda really has kind of thrown a wide net um, from, you know, and from radio announcements through robot and, you know, drone. Jesse, I think we just lost you. Um, and actually, ironically, it was as you're talking about, you know, the distinctions in Wi-Fi. Um, so Phil, did you have any closing thoughts there? We have about two or three minutes left. Here. Okay, I, I, quickly, I think um, just to sort of reiterate what I wrote in the chat, but I think that, you know, one, there's been a lot of government support in China. Um, so, you know, that um, financially they've supported things to, to keep the prices down. Um, there's been a great, you know, there was, was already a great delivery network in place. Um, and, uh, and then there's been, you know, sort of inexpensive uh, testing equipment and inexpensive technologies um, in China. So, so uh, those things have combined to really allow for, for, um, for I think, not having a, a large difference across the social strata in terms of uh, um, how people and businesses can respond. That's awesome. Um, well, with the last minute or so, um, you know, I, I will hop in on that last question myself. I started this by saying how the pandemic has really taught us uh, just how connected we are, um, however distanced we may be, right? Um, and you know, it's a, it is an interesting point to end on, where um, this pandemic is not monolithic, though we're all experiencing it in different ways. Um, there are some of us who don't have the luxury of, of even connecting the way that we're connecting uh right now. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, treat each other with kindness, uh, treat each other well, make the world a better place. That's what we're all here for anyway, right? Um, so <laughs> thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to listen to your stories. Um, and I think uh, Eliza will follow up. I, are we making the slides available? Is this recorded? I don't know the answers to those questions. Myself. This is all recorded and everything will be made available on our, on our website. Excellent. Well, to those on the East Coast, good night, farewell, sweet dreams. Um, <laughs> Jesse, good morning. I hear the roosters, I think, in the background. Thank you for doing this. <laughs> it's amazing. Andres, Phil, thank you so much. It's been thank nice. You guys. It's thank you guys. Thank you guys, too. It's been awesome. <laughs> uh, Hope we can do this again. <laughs> great. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone, for Bye. listening. Have a great night. Bye-bye. <laughs>